Good morning, good morning, and welcome back to another episode of the Talk to Chair Morning Show, where we go over tips, tricks, ideas, and exercises to help make you the absolute best entrepreneur you can be, not only for yourself, but for the people you love and care about most. We have a really fun episode this morning. You become better for not only you, but the people you love and care about most. You got to be a little uncomfortable and take that leap of faith. You're in control of the process. I'm here with you. If we don't continue to grow, if we don't continue to move on, we will be sad and upset. As uh, I'm interviewing my brother, my bigger brother, role model, superstar, it's in my heart as always. And we're out here in Denver, Colorado to uh, have some fun, some adventures. Sadly, our adventures are wrapping up, but I think... uh, (laughs) We'll go ahead and we'll start with that. Uh, thanks for coming on to the show. Yeah, brother, of course, man. Brother Steve. <laughs> so this, uh, we started, let's talk about the trip over the last couple of days. We've done some mountain biking. We've done some rock climbing. We've done some hiking. And uh, man, my I got to say my legs don't still don't feel very good um kind of pushing the limit but if you say (laughs) if you had to rank in order of your favorites of the things that we got to do between hiking mountain biking and rock climbing how would you rank them uh first i just want to backtrack because you're like oh man it's such a bummer our adventures are coming to an end our bodies are pretty sick needing some rest yeah um but you know of course like climbing is my favorite sport you know train every day for it it's hands down my favorite activity um but it was really nice mountain biking um yeah especially when you think it's gonna be flat and it's not yeah like oh this is gonna be so cool going down forgetting the fact that you have to get back up the hill which is unfortunate but you know you gotta earn your turn in colorado yeah well so earn your turn what does uh what does that even mean so mountain biking culture is huge in Colorado. Just cycling in general is just massive in Colorado. I mean, whether it's road biking on the 93 from like Golden to Boulder, a bunch of psychos doing that on that highway. Uh, Or going up and down like Boulder Canyon or like Eldo. But if you get into actual like single track mountain biking, earn your turn means, hey, if you want to go downhill, you got to like propel yourself uphill, which you know, it was a huge detraction to a lot of people. You're a big lifty guy. Yeah. The, <laughs> so to preface park riding is the first two or three times I ever went mountain biking, we it was a park where you got lifted up to the top of the mountain and then you ripped down and it was really, really fun and all exciting. And then it was uh we Durango. were in Durango. Durango, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Durango here in Colorado. And I'd never ridden up a mountain with a with a bicycle so before. Much, so much harder than advertised. Yeah, it is so much harder than and you're just going so slow. <laughs> you're going, you can it feels like I think we could hike faster. Oh, you for so, sure can. Yeah. And you're just pedaling lowest gear. Lowest gear possible. Feet are just blazing. But you're just like trying to balance the bike as you're like walking yeah. uphill and trying to restart. Uh, I probably looked like an idiot multiple times, and that's okay, right? Uh, where you're trying to, it's so uphill, and you fall off your bike, and then you have to get back on. But the gear's so low that you're like spinning out of control, and your, <laughs> your handlebars aren't straight. But either way, no, that was uh, that was really really painful on my quads for sure, for sure. But that was. Um, <laughs> Um, that was my first experience with non-park riding, earn your turn. So thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, mountain biking is probably, like, outside of climbing, it's, like, my favorite activity. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just not in the market where I can buy a $10,000 bike. Oh, my and, gosh, yeah, and, they're and really expensive. fly through the trees and hit jumps. and I mean... I don't know. It's interesting to me because I love mountain biking and, you know, I've, I've gotten to go snowboarding now and um, I love so many of these outdoor activities, but seemingly 
climbing, even though it's not visually going to agree with most folks, like it's like the safest sport out there in comparison. Cause if you're, you're doing like marathon, like trail running, your knees are just getting like beaten down to nothing. And then mountain biking, if you're going downhill at like 30 miles an hour and you hit a rock, like that's just, yeah, you're going to get bodied. Yeah. You get bodied. <laughs> and, uh, so like actually going out with you on bikes was like super fun. Cause it's just not a normal activity for me. It was a great way to explore the South Platte region. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was nice instead of just like looking down and around, it was like nice to see the entire valleys uh, sprawl out in front of us. Yeah. And then that would leave last off on the list for things we got is hiking. Do you, uh, do you do much hiking anymore? No, I, when I lived in Arizona, I, I, I still loved it because I hadn't really found my stride in climbing and I thought it was a great way to like commune with nature without any like real technical like ability or like training. Totally. Yeah, that's a huge reason why I love it. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, you know, once you start to up the ante, like it's this like dangerous game you play because you find this like flow state or this high doing other activities. And then you get to experience so much more because you're moving faster and covering ground. And so now just hiking personally, like, like, I don't mean to dismiss it as like a not awesome activity, but it just feels so slow. Yeah. Like you can move so much faster. Granted, you're going to be a lot hungrier, thirstier, like sore. Yeah. But you get to take in so much more at a faster rate. Mm -hmm. And so now I don't, I don't hike much and some of my negative correlations with it come from like having a full pack with rope and gear and like a couple days where yeah, you're carrying weight yeah and you know you're having that type two fun uphill yeah. i just it it's not as appealing as it once was yeah and i'm probably speaking more on the side of just you go to a trail if if you're ever looking for a hike all trails is that, that app is the app the you can find really cool trails wherever you want to go i've used that non-stop <clears throat> but probably to preface you're still hiking all the time because you have oh, to yeah. hike to get to the places oh yeah that you that you do want to go which is <clears throat> crazy how do you have what's uh the longest hike so you call it hiking in yeah when you're going to say a particular rock climbing yeah route yeah. What's uh what's like the average hike in that you've been messing around? Wait, Clear Creek was nothing. Yeah, that's and then a... there's other places. Uh, where was that one you took me where we had to hike in like over like three miles? Was Devil's Head or? Mm, yeah, yeah, we did like a thousand feet in elevation in like two miles or whatever. Yeah, and, like there was no real trail maintenance, so you're like every step you take, you lose a step. Like. <laughs> It, just because of how like loose the pine needles and dirt are mm -hmm. you're not really like making too much progress but yeah i mean like it it was like hiking half dome the death slabs like that was like three miles and 2500 feet of vert like pitch black and then you have like sport climbing canyons like clear creek where you park hike for five seconds and you're at a wall yeah and it, it, there is these stark differences like El Dorado Canyon, the maintenance in the park is crazy. Like the amount of work these park rangers have done because you'll gain like 600 feet, in like a quarter mile, mm -hmm. but they have literally built stairs out of boulders yeah. to help like avoid soil erosion yeah. and like let climbers recreate like responsibly. And so it, there are so many different hiking experiences I've had. I mean, the things that we've done in Banff together, um, I know I brought this up already, but like the hike off of like half dome, yeah, it's still like traumatizing to me. <laughs> but yeah, it's, I mean it's it's unreal sometimes, but uh, yeah, I mean Eldo will always keep me in shape. You gain six hundred feet in a quarter mile with a full bag. It's like, well, you know, how much does all the gear you uh, weigh roughly? You think thirty five pounds? Thirty five pounds. You know, food, water, rope, gear, mm -hmm. um, layers at your climbing shoes i mean all of it right yeah um summer's around so lighter loads really excited for that mm -hmm. and it'll be a little more free finally <laughs> the in clarifying on half dome in yosemite um the i guess we might as well do this now ranking off 
your favorite national parks that that you've been to maybe in the yeah let's do that just say your top five national parks and i'll do mine okay uh banff is number one uh yosemite number two zion um I'm going to go Cascades number four. That's just astounding out there. I mean, if you catch a good weather window, it's astounding. It'll just blow your hair back. And uh, the Tetons. Um, Tetons. Like, yep, yep. Uh, those are for sure my top five. If you gave me an all-expenses paid trip for like a month between Yosemite or Banff, I'll go Banff. Banff, yeah. The wildlife is just – I mean, you know, as a climber, Yosemite is much more historical, but – what I like to do and how I like to recreate and also being that far North in the summer and like the days never really ending is so much more fun. Yeah. That it's, that was one of the most shocking things to me going to a national park in the summer, like far North say in Canada or in the Dakotas or even like Montana where yeah. the glaciers at, uh, it's light out until 11. And so you'd be hanging around a campfire and say, if you're drinking or something like that. And then before you know it, you're like, oh, wow, it's uh, it's still light out. And and then you check the clock and it's like 1130, which is super weird feeling to me. I couldn't imagine living there no. for especially the winters when it's the opposite side and it's dark, <laughs> like 20 hours a day. Um, that'd be that'd be pretty brutal. <laughs> the OK. If I had to do my national park list number, and it's going to sound like I'm copying, but I have, I promise, good reasons on the first three. <laughs> the number one, I would say Banff in Canada. That park is absolutely bonkers. I mean, it's one of the coolest. You go to the lakes, and then you can see like 20 feet into the water, see the bottom of the rocks. It's so clear. It's, it's really magical. The number two would be, yeah, definitely Yosemite, Yosemite Valley. If you can do like the mist trail and I mean, just even driving around in your car, it's so good. It's really busy it and is. it's not that big. No, the valley's incredibly small. Yeah. the I mean, it's big. Don't get me wrong. But with how many people are coming from all over the world and then Zion, Zion National Park in Utah, absolute um, banger incredible number four i'd have to go with smoky mountains uh, oh, national yeah. park yeah. in tennessee yeah. that uh that park is absolutely crazy and then yellowstone um yellowstone, yellowstone it's with the geyser and the bison the bison it's massive yellowstone is so oh, huge yeah the, yeah the i don't even think i saw a third of it no, um I went, it's it's like impossible. And I'm not trying to diminish your time there, but I mean, like the Yellowstone acreage is just so vast and expansive, and the ranges and hidden valleys in between the ridge lines and stuff. I mean, it's just mind boggling country out there. Yeah. The, do you recommend um, people? So we went, one of my favorite activities that we ever did was when we went kayaking in Banff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely incredible. I need to get my video editor to chuck some footage of that <laughs> in here. The it's talking about how clear the water is and stuff. The do you recommend though? Did you like those inflatable uh kayaks? Y you know, um if you buy buy them new. Buy them brand new. Buy them brand buy them, new. Buy them brand new. You never know how they stored them before. Yeah. Because you remember the people we were with were in the other one that was deflating. They were just doing donuts. Yeah. Like they couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. It's like, well, that's pretty inconvenient. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> And you don't want to be in a national park. The water is so cold in Canada. It's not. I don't, if you, it's probably in the 30s. 30 dude? high 30s yeah it was, yeah it was brisk yeah you don't want to go down in that water <laughs> and um i know we do sometimes the like the cold exposure but more than a couple minutes and not ideal i don't i don't have that type of character development yet the for cold exposure and a band flake I, I i can't do it so what's up with the whole anti over the last Okay, when did you start hating winners so much? And winners are fake in Denver, Colorado, by the way. The, they're, they're we, had a, we, had, we had a real winner this year. A lot of snow. The you, Dude, you weren't here. It was tough. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> seeing um, 
I was, I guess all I see is uh, keeping track of the temperature gauge and, but living and driving in, I suppose. Or were the roads clear? Or? Yeah, they were clear. It was fine. I just, I don't know. Um, so here in the front range of Colorado, every January, we average about six days a month of 60 degree weather or warmer. This year we got zero. Like it was a, like a legit winter by Colorado standards. Like, uh, yeah, okay. uh, I think the highest temperature we saw in January. I know this is not a lot to bitch about, but it was like 52. It was like the highest recorded temp, mm-hmm. which, you know, moving here and living here because of the climate and everything was kind of a letdown this winter. Yeah. Um, but my relationship with uh, winter really declined like the last year I lived in Iowa. I remember. Yeah. You know, I lived next to the Mississippi River in Dubuque, Iowa, and all three years that I lived there, um, there would always be this two-week stretch in February where, like, the wind chill would reach, like, (laughs) negative 50. (laughs) And, yeah, it just it legitimately hurt to breathe outside. Yeah, not cool. And, you know, like, the snow was so compacted, and you'd go, like, snow blind if you tried to spend time outside, even if it hurt to breathe, and you're, like, trying to get some vitamin D in your life, and you're just like, you know what? I found it traumatizing. I just, like, (laughs) if I get cold, I just, I can't help but have this visceral feeling and be like, dude, this this is not worth it. Whatever I'm doing, I'm like, you know what? I'm just not enjoying myself. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, I'll expose myself to some pretty nasty elements, like in my pursuit of climbing sometimes. uh, We refer to them as like the screaming barfies, like when your hands go so cold that you've lost sensation in them. Yeah. And then when they heat back up and you get that like really painful feeling, like that'll happen a lot. But the idea of being somewhere where you'll just go weak, long stretches of like negative temperatures, I just will never, I can't. Yeah, I can't, I can't do it. I'm so soft I, after living in Phoenix. I'm like, I just will never do that again. How long did you live in Phoenix? Five and a half years. Yeah. Yeah. And just uh, coming on. Yeah. Just two years here in Denver now. Yeah. Okay. What would you put higher, Arizona or Colorado? Both badass states, by the way. Absolutely. Too. Don't move their property taxes are shot. And, um, they're you know take every penny from you. Don't move here. It's it's very loaded. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's funny because in Arizona, everyone that lives there and had lived there for a good couple of years, it's a very transient place. Like you'll get a lot of people that are lifers there, and they go. Yeah, I was just moving out to California. My car broke down in Arizona, so I just stayed here. And so we we always joked about Arizona being the poor man's California. You get the palm trees in the valley and, you know, the paradise winters in the valley. But then we have enough mountain chains where you can escape certain climates. Um, you know, Sedona, incredibly famous for... All Sedona, the, very beautiful. Yeah, for all of its formations and be- beautiful geologic uh, uh, location, but very temperate, all things considered. Uh, and of course, you have the San Francisco peaks to the north and Mount Lemmon to the south. And so, and then you'll get these random uh, mountain formations in the middle of the desert, which shoot from like 800 feet elevation uh, above sea level to like. 5,000 feet into the sky. And so they'll have different weather patterns because they're just so far above the like desert floor. These pressure systems will come in and just collide against the mountains. And there will be different ecosystems on top of the mountains. It's wild. Um, if you're feeling a little cowboy and you don't like crowds, Arizona's the better state. Uh, water issues will arise. The tap water there. So, Sheesh. yeah, tough, <laughs> tough infrastructure in the Valley of the Sun. It makes sense. It goes a long way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Colorado River is being stretched pretty thin there. And by the time, like, all the agricultural runoff hits way down south, the Valley of the Sun kind of gets the short end of the stick. I mean, you know, there are other ways to treat your water and, you know, stay healthy and be informed. But, yeah, definitely one of the trade-offs in the desert 
one of the bigger trade-offs actually where's the water where's, uh, where's the water just down the road here in the rockies yeah that's true that'll be an issue but no so you would prefer colorado over arizona then if if employment and uh, now now it's friendship as well because I, i'm really fortunate with uh, people i know and love here on the front range of colorado whether from Fort Collins all the way down to the Springs. Like I know and and really cherish a lot of people here. Um, but if it was like no networking or like employment concerns, I would either Southwest Colorado or Northern Arizona, like very, very remote rural locations, but um, the community would stay more or less the same. That's, uh, that's kind of cool how it starts to kind of work towards more of a center point there between the two areas that you, yeah. that you really like with the, if you had to give any advice to somebody, I know moving to a new area can be, can be really scary and making friends. It almost matters to me more or less of where I'm at. So a lot of times is who, who I'm around and who I, who yeah. I can spend my time with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've always done really well scooping up friends and just doing new things and um you have any advice for like moving to a new area and making some friends yeah i mean you know it you bring up how it, it is scary and it, it it's tough because um if you have a adventurous spirit and you want to go somewhere new and like you know maybe begin a new chapter in your life totally you know it's tough um but if you are passionate about something and that area offers it mm -hmm. you won't have a hard time making friends because if you're vulnerable you're passionate about some activity some outlet of creativity for sure um not that difficult um it'll take time right everything takes yeah it time. takes time given allowing it to take time and not being too flustered because yeah but then you don't have the instant gratification with it either because it takes time yeah and, you know it does take effort because i mean there are a lot of climbing well wouldn't call them climbing partners but when i first moved to the state of colorado one of the meccas of rock climbing in the world for sure just because of access yeah you know i met hundreds of people i'm like oh cool we should go climbing sometime and those relationships didn't work out yeah i mean i i have just like a select crew of people that I would call night and day and be like, Hey, like, let's go out and do this dumb idea or this rad route. But the amount of people you'll almost cycle through, it's like going on bad first dates, right? Like someone yeah. feeds you too much rope and you take a giant whipper and you're like, Oh, that was kind of hairy. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, someone turns out to be like, and like a personality clash, right? Like you just don't vibe with the person because, um, you know, they could be, you know, you know, let's not get into politics, but the, the idea of like moving somewhere, being vulnerable and being passionate about a particular activity or outlet of creativity, uh, will allow you to make friendships and loved ones in your life. Um, but if you're like a diehard skier and you move to Georgia, that's not going to work. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you're an art fanatic and you want to live this and want to live somewhere in the wild west and move to Santa Fe, New Mexico, you'll have no issues making friends there. If you're passionate about the art that. scene there is really unique and wild. It's Very like cool. the top third grossing art capitals in the country. Mm. Um, very traditional though. That's a whole different uh, conversation, but yeah, it's like, let's say you're passionate about running. Oh, yeah go out to utah like cross country they have all those ultra runner events and yeah I mean, yeah i mean not saying you gotta go do 100 mile you don't run. have to be david goggins <laughs> yeah but, you know if you're really passionate about something and and there's an area in the country that inspires you and you can see yourself progressing in that environment like you don't have to worry so much about making friends that will come with it naturally. Also, yeah. you know, being a little vulnerable and, you know, taking chances and, you know, if, if you open up to people and you're genuine, you're kind and forgiving, 
and I mean, it's pretty easy to make friends. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. That's well said. So finding your passion or something that you'd want to really do, whether that's rock climbing or running or, um, we're definitely, we use more outdoor examples cause we're outdoor people, but I'm sure that can relate to many other things, finding your passion, talking about art and, um, and it seems like you're going to have to bounce around a little bit, maybe, yeah. possibly. And that's okay, too. Yeah. Wanting to try a few different areas. We're going to, I want to go through. So Captain Steve has been really good at a, like a very unique list of stuff that's badass, but you need to go. I want to run through it. And then I want you to tell me your favorite area in the country to do each one of these things. Okay. And then we'll go through and we'll kind of pick apart each one. Um, okay. So first off wrestling <laughs> or wrestling, the, <laughs> the funny duck. I used to lo love watching you uh, wrestle. I still like watching wrestling um, today. Pretty yeah. crazy. Love the UFC. Love it's pretty incredible how 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 it's like very necessary tool. So yeah, yeah. It's, location wise, what's your favorite area in the country for wrestling? I guess building off of what you firstly stated is um, it is really awesome to see the impact MMA is making on the sport of wrestling. Like yeah, wrestling's not as fringe. Well, I mean it's still pretty fringe, but it's a very odd sport to most of like the country like there are countries like iran and then russia i mean they like really celebrate the sport but mm -hmm. here in the u.s it has become much more normal to the everyday person because of that exposure from mma granted plenty of people still don't like it yeah but it, it's it's much more normal nowadays and uh I guess building off of that for a location, I guess just because I went to school in the state and the culture there is insane. Like everyone <laughs> knows or has a family member that is a wrestler in the state of Iowa. It's crazy. Yeah. Like they actually it's huge in Iowa. Yeah. They celebrate. It's a state of 4 million people and everyone knows at least one wrestler. Like mm -hmm. It's crazy to me. Green, you know, it's compared to everywhere else in the country where yeah. like in Colorado, I haven't heard a single person talk of the, the sport is oddly growing here, but that's a huge, uh, migration out of the rust belt into the Western frontier of the U S right. And so a lot of, a lot of people are bringing these Midwestern traditions, Yeah, um, whether it's beer drinking, <laughs> wrestling, like it, these, these sports are moving out West and it's really interesting. Um, Granted, um, still, I mean, in comparison, like the youth programs all the way to right, yeah. I mean, it's still like Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Those are just the staples. There's no arguing it. It'll never change. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is changing a little bit in Colorado. But just because the the family dynamics and the culture and the celebration of the sport, it's, it's got to be Iowa. Okay. Iowa. That it makes so much sense. Have you ever been to one of uh, in Iowa City at the university, one of their meets? Yeah, yeah, I got to go to a Hawkeye Duel. They're pretty jam packed for um, sixteen thousand people. Wow, yeah. So yeah, wrestling's pretty cool. It's electric there. It's wild. Like they're about it. There are so many Hawkeyes that have won in there that should have not won just feeding off the crowd. Yeah. Like, uh so many guys have wrestled in Carver and you just by like the first three minutes, like they just you can tell they're drained. They just can't handle it. There's just so much going on. There yeah. are sixteen thousand Iowans screaming at you to lose. Very intense situation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot for a twenty year old to go yeah. through. No, uh, no, it's wrestling's so unique and so. I mean, we could go on and on about so many of the benefits. The Next one I wanted to talk about was longboarding. Yeah. yeah longboarding. Yeah. If you ever go to Steve's Instagram, some of the older videos of you longboarding. You're going to have to scroll back kind of far. Yeah, yeah. The, down the little mountains. Uh, first off, what was the fastest you think you've ever gone on a longboard? I clocked in at 43 miles an hour. 43. That is absolutely flying out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is a lot when you are only like 
couple like a foot off the ground. Right. The so favorite location in the country for longboarding. You know, it was really cool uh, in Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, the San Francisco Peak uh, mountain chain runs through Flagstaff. Oh. And uh, so you have a lot of the rolling hills. I mean, it sits at like 7,500 feet in elevation. But um, the San Francisco pe Peaks and that mountain range run through Flag, more or less. And so there are multiple parks with paved roads. And um, an old partner of mine would, you know, like we'd go hiking and then I'd bring my board and then she would drive me to the top of the hill and I'd take a few runs. Um, there were times where I just earned it. And then like the city of Phoenix, like I would find these like really nice undeveloped neighborhoods, but they had paved roads up the hillside. Yeah. And uh, I would just walk back up Dude. after like a half a mile run. I'm carving, going toe to heel side and everything, doing speed checks, not mm -hmm. trying to hurt myself. And, uh, <laughs> But yeah, at Flagstaff, because of the, the forest and and everyone was really encouraging out there. Flagstaff's a huge hippie town. And so people would just see some dude like hitting a front side like speed check at like 30 miles an hour around this corner. And people would just be like, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so that was that always that place always like was near near and dear to my heart. Nice. What uh you skateboarded when we were kids. Yeah. Is that what got you into that? And it's just kind of a natural progression thing. Um, I just don't see it that often. Yeah. I know you did a competition for it in yeah. Indiana yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so long ago. Yeah. In Southern Indiana where there's actually some hills. Um, you know, it's interesting because now that I'm older, I have a better understanding of like what is attractive to me, like activity wise. Because I used to think it was like the intensity of the situation, but it's actually like the flow state mm -hmm. where you don't think about the past, you don't think about the future. Yeah. You don't, oh, yeah, I left the oven on, or like some self doubt, like, you know, they're like, oh my God, and I got wedged in fifth grade. You don't think about <laughs> any of that. Yeah. Like the moment is so intense that you can only live in the presence and uh or the present and i guess someone broke that down to me i was like 26 or something like that and, um they're just like oh it's just you know a cheat code instead of hiking to the himalayas and meditating for five years you can just live a very deliberate and intense lifestyle and you will gain that moment in the present and so um that was my big thing. I didn't understand it at the time because I was like, oh, I just like to go fast. Right. <laughs> and, and then when you stop going fast immediately, you're like, oh, that's, that was kind of rough. Yeah. The It seemed that the intensity almost forced the hand of focus and yeah. just and then doing it for so long. Oh, yeah. Very fo – everything, all of the things that are wrestling to – now into longboarding the intensity is really high and the focus needs to be there you're going to get bodied yeah you're going to get hurt you're going to get hurt the so top place in the country for longboarding i'm going to say arizona slept on you yeah. arizona slept on shout out to arizona <laughs> the next one three on the list jujitsu oh yeah, jujitsu yeah. rolling wearing pajamas yeah doing all that crazy Re stuff really uh, really aggressive hugging. tap right snap <laughs> tap right snap yeah man um yet again uh you know it was really interesting because the uh year that i won nogi worlds at bluebell there was a arizonan who also won purple nogi worlds and then a brown belt who won Nogi Worlds, and then he also won Pan Americans at Brown. Honestly, I was like, wow, this state is actually pretty Turn sad. it on. Because, yeah. I mean, California is the mecca of jiu-jitsu. Um, a lot of Brazilian greats migrated to California, mostly for the money. But, I mean, obviously, California is California, or it used to be at least. And so, like, the culture was really great for jiu-jitsu, and the history behind jiu-jitsu in California is really intriguing if you're curious um but i yeah i mean 
Shout out to AC. Shout out to Arizona. Arizona, rock and roll. Also, you really earn it in the summer there. If like you're going to a gi or just strictly Brazilian jiu jitsu practice and you're wearing the kimono, yeah, the AC is cranked in the gym. It doesn't matter. It's gonna be a hot day. Yeah, it's gonna be a very hot day. No dry fit. You're <laughs> just in like a thick kimono. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and some character development for sure. The what was your favorite thing about jiu jitsu? If you had to, yeah. mm. or just something that comes to mind, you know, with grappling sports, you know, I think about the intensity again, but my favorite aspect of grappling sports was the camaraderie. Really? Yeah. Cause, um, you have, you have bad days totally where you just get wrecked in training. Yeah. You know, I was working construction and competing in jujitsu. So there were days where I'd be just sunburned dehydrated tired but it's like three weeks out from the world championships yeah you you don't get to take that yeah time you gotta off. get it going and you know the people that become your best friends are there to like pick you up when you're down for like, sure and that was the same thing with college wrestling like hey you're 15 pounds down you have another like <laughs> <laughs> you have another the like, weight cuts yeah man, the weight cuts yeah and i mean like you know are your favorite people they know how to like at least entertain you might not laugh because of how hungry you are or yeah tired you for are, sure but at least they're entertaining you and they're supportive and they're like assuring you like hey what you're doing is right yeah you just have to persevere like i love the camaraderie that comes with grappling sports that's cool it seems it's it's such a good balance of both worlds like you're talking about because when you get out to the mat it is you oh just you but then in the training and the support and whether you know you're cutting weight or you're just learning new technique and stuff it seems like such a team it environment is. but when you perform it's an individual thing so it kind of seems like a cool mix of both worlds because you train and yeah. then you gotta go do the thing yeah and i mean like you know when it comes game time like dude it is just <laughs> you out there yeah, like, yeah. Uh, I, you know and it's tough like I, I know some killers that have performance anxiety like i do some of the guys i would train with would just wreck me and yeah. you know, i would like just get bullied some days like there's this one cat named daddy shout out love you dude his guillotine was so automatic if i even shot him for like a single or double he just lock it up and there was one time he like actually crushed my windpipe <laughs> my throat hurt for like a week but, you know it was wild because he never like he never meddled when we were training together and like there were multiple tournaments i'd bring home hardware and he didn't mm -hmm. and it was wild and like i just it didn't make any sense to me like showtime of like you know wrestling in college and nationals and stuff it gets you kind of like acclimated for the big stage but mm -hmm. you train with these absolute show stoppers and then it's time for the show and you know they freeze they hesitate they're not used yeah. to the environment and the difference and the crowd and like people yelling at you in portuguese and stuff <laughs> yes yeah. It's, yeah it's it's unique um but it is just wild because like there were so many brilliant grapplers that i've like trained with and they would just beat me into the dirt and then come show time they they couldn't do it with uh performance anxiety i think it's or i can't remember if this fear is right like the number one fear is public speaking i yeah. think or the most common most common mo mo most most common it seems that's if you want to just take the root out of that imagine um performance anxiety do you think wrestling in bigger crowds and stuff like what or do you or did it shell shock you too when you started like when you were in jiu-jitsu or what kind of helped with frying your end of it because it always seemed like you handled that stuff really well well i don't know if you remember this but the first time i made it to state in high school totally choked just <laughs> went out there like a total turd like i was like oh my god look at all these people like i just froze like a deer in the headlights yeah but that experience was so good for me yeah and, i mean granted i took it and ran with it like experience wise because i mean like i was pretty deflated afterwards and like, i worked pretty hard to get there and just lost like yeah. it was tough but, yeah that um, is tough. but it came to it like a frequency thing like mm -hmm. oh the more you do it the more you get used yeah. to it like yeah. hey if you're going to be a public speaker you need to go out there and lay an egg every once in a while and they're uh, 
I know comedians talk about that a lot. And they're like, you'll go out there and if you're rusty, you'll just, just <laughs> fart a dud. <laughs> yeah. um, bomb. And, and so like my sophomore year of college, I went out nationals. I was like ranked second, made it to the sem- semifinals. I'm like one match away from the finals wrestling a kid that I'd already beaten like bad earlier in the year. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to win a national title. Laid an egg, lost an OT. I'm like, what? But, I mean, like, I looked at the crowd, all the co- – like, the other college recruiters, because I was junior college, like, all these D1 schools, like, and their coaches are sitting in the crowd yeah. and all these expectations, and I just botched it. But, yeah. um, you know, come around my senior year, it's like, dude, no stage fright. You get used to the crowds. You get used to the boos and the oohs and ahs and yeah. something cool. And by the time I got into jujitsu, I was like, this is perfectly normal. Yeah. Like, I've been doing this since I was, like, 10, dude. Like, you go out there, you hear a lot of shouting, and just kind of, like, mm-hmm. you know, block it out and do what you've been trained to do. Yeah. The, uh, it's, what's the, the term, like, when you're in, in the moment you're combating, you, like, always revert back to your training or something like that you yeah i mean you really go into this like primal place more or less, and it just becomes muscle memory yeah you yeah. Fu- i mean like it's good a good coach won't actually coach too much like maybe these like finite positions but mm-hmm. hey let's breathe let's slow our heart rate down hey right? good body position let's keep working on the edge hey you know wrestle through those positions but like nothing like direct where your brain has to kick in and you start doing critical thinking because yeah. like that part's over with yeah and now it's just muscle memory so yeah. a good coach will just be like hey interesting let's calm down yeah you already know what to do but here like let's finish through this position next time or like hey you know let's be aware of, interesting like, yeah yeah that's uh that's so wild to think that yeah, I, whenever I, you hear, whenever I'm watching like the Big Ten tournament and they go to the corners, it's really, that makes so much sense that this isn't a time to psychologically process in no, the situation. No. <laughs> situation. It's very stressful. Yeah, yeah, versus like, oh my God, my heart rate is at 185 and <laughs> it, it is showtime. So jujitsu, um, so just doing it. And getting out there, getting comfortable with with yourself, and, and just being in front of people, and yeah, it, it makes too much sense. To that's probably not the answer, you know, you want to hear, but it's like you're gonna have to go out there and not be super amazing. I'm sure everyone universally understands that. Yeah, but it's still like shocking to the heart when you still um, first get out there. Yeah, and I mean, like you know, that's that's a huge moment of vulnerability circling back into being vulnerable. I mean, like, you know, a lot of people want to talk the talk, but never want to walk the walk. And it's, you know, it's tough because when you're on the other side and you get beat down and you're in front of a bunch of people, like you can't help but be like insecure. Yeah. Um, When I was in the uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world finals in Gi, got leg locked, tapped out. Now. like two minutes in and i just like looked up and all these brazilians are like screaming and dudes like doing a backflip in my face and it's like it's a pretty vulnerable moment man <laughs> that's yeah. a tough moment that is because yeah. you're not the one celebrating right? right um and so you just but to like reap the rewards you have to be out there and i mean like it's yeah, circling back into like friendship and making friends like you know, you got to put yourself out there first or it's just never going to work. Right. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. The putting yourself out there and being vulnerable and compassionate. Very, very inspiring. The getting to the, the last one. So that would be, we've talked about wrestling, longboarding, jujitsu, and last but not least, rock climbing. Yeah. Rock climbing. <laughs> Climb on. Oh, first, tell me before we start getting the location or whatever. Yeah. What the hell are we? Uh, this is a practice wall. We're in the we're in the master training shed. Yeah. So I'm actually wearing the shirt. So this is the Climbing Project Readiness Institute, or as most people like to refer to it as the uh, Chronic Pain Reinjury Institute. Oh, jeez. Um. No, I mean, we have a campus board, we have gymnast rings, we mm-hmm. have a hangboard, and then this is the uh, 
spray wall is what we refer to it as and you just like you'll know, tape up problems and yeah you uh it's at a 25 degree angle and most of these holds are about a pad on your fingers wide um but yeah this thing is um uh, how we train and get strong and get ready for the bigger stuff outside because it's like you just have to train your body get ready in these positions because it's like if you never held on to like three-quarter edge before you get up like 500 feet yeah like you're not gonna be able to hold on especially as you're like shaking <laughs> yeah. Feet. yeah um but yeah this is uh where i train every day um this is where i spend most of my time getting ready for the hillsides and the bigger objectives and, and everything colorado has to offer a climber yeah this uh did you build this wall yourself you build it with uh tau your best friend or how did you guys uh how did this even tal actually took this objective on himself so when i moved in he had already um he already put up the spray wall so i came in i was like oh my god this is i mean even before i moved in with the guy uh we joked that the studio i live in in the other part of this property is the uh, cpri dorms yeah <laughs> <laughs> like the main trainee here but yeah um he built this wall and he put a uh, a roof finish to it and i don't think you can see it in the camera but yeah. there's even a roof finish but mm -hmm. campus board and the hang board and everything we contributed to we actually reinforced the uh the rafters for this guy because i mean there are some moves going into the roof that you're like maybe we should have two by sixes up there instead of just two by fours <laughs> it seems like rock climbing's helped your uh construction skills i remember you had built a a, a wall in arizona yeah when you used yeah. to live in arizona um you gotta you gotta train gotta train gotta train hard the <laughs> how often do you uh do you train for climbing and how often are you climbing now well the tough part is finding a balance between training very specific things like it's funny uh after yosemite last year we came back and we did an assessment like through a coach's program to see like what your weakness is and what your strengths were yeah very cool yeah and it turns out like i have baby bitch finger strength <laughs> um like because what you'll do is you'll hang on these small edges and attach weight to your hips and like however long you can hold on with that weight will mm -hmm. kind of indicate like how strong you are yeah. um and they did the assessment and they were like wow you like probably project like 511 i know that'll be confusing but i was like i project like 512 plus 513 mm -hmm. significantly harder but my finger strength is just non-existent. My footwork, my psychological game, core strength, great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just turns out it was like a legitimately like finger strength issue for me. Yeah. <laughs> this, uh, so you train how often you'd say? I'd say at least three days out of the week. Three days. And then try and go outside and climb because that's the fun part. Yeah. And, and go and climb at least three days a week outside yeah this um getting to get outside i guess location wise jumping into that where's your favorite uh where's your favorite place to climb sport climbing yeah we'll go sport climbing the there's a variety of different types of climbing uh if the talking about sport climbing where you're you know you're roped in and then you know you're climbing upward and clipping yourself as you go probably the most beautiful area i've been to recently is like the backside of the flat irons outside of boulder boulder colorado now so far i mean here on the front range easily accessible you have to hike through these beautiful lands yeah and, um the backside of the flat irons is very hard very tall very exposed so like you get that like that's not the point of climbing but you get that adrenaline rush totally and like oh my goodness like if i botch this next hold i'm gonna go for like a 20 foot whip and you're like ah yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. it's um, intense but i absolutely love the backside of the flat irons there's like no noise pollution you're so far away from the road yeah and you're in these beautiful forests um mm -hmm. and most of the people i've met out there in these like hard man areas we're all on the same ML, very kind people. And I mean, 
you know, you can start up a conversation with anyone because you have that common ground. So, uh, yeah, the backside of the flat irons have been my favorite so far. Yeah, the boulder's so cool. There's um, a ton to do. It's not as big as I thought it was. No, it's no, uh, no. pretty little. The is, but it's bigger than golden, right? Yeah, bigger than golden for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and it's weird because now Boulder's like kind of expanded into like Louisville and stuff like that. So oh, okay. it's kind of these conglomerate areas that have all kind of like melted into each other from housing. Louisville, I thought if I read this right, they had like a dozen crimes last year. It seems like the safest place ever. Or it, I'm yeah, I mean it's pretty relaxed. <laughs> yeah. there. Like a lot of Birkenstocks. I yeah. mean, a lot yeah. of mellow vibes. Um, mm -hmm. And I've just, if I'm just being honest, very, very affluent. I, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's amazing in a geological like sense. I mean, you're next to the Flatirons, you're next to Boulder Canyon, you're next to El Dorado Canyon, you're very close to Rocky Mountain National Park. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, you are just like kind of a football throw away, all things considered, from like Golden, Colorado, too. Yeah. This, uh, so you had a pretty serious goal recently with climbing i wanted to ask you a few questions about goals because yeah, yeah you seem like you've always had like one specific vision and then kind of tackling it head on yeah the through some of the stuff we're we've been talking about so what 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 was the grade of uh your your last uh big ascent that you were really psyched about yeah so real quick just so it's a little more easily digestible um the yosemite decimal system is how we grade difficulty in rock climbing mm -hmm. and anything that's like slightly like graded will give all right if you're not jumping from like one big rock to one big rock like going through a talus field and it's just like this continuous grade we'll give it like five zero but as the rock continues to become less featureless and then eventually more vertical we'll go from five zero five one five two up to 510 and then we start breaking into these like subjective lettering grades um so once you get to like dead vertical and then holds become very sparse and it's very technical and you should be wearing a rope right it, it'll be like 510a 510b 510c 510d and then you start over at 511. now my goal um was to climb my first 513a you know new number grade and i mean that's starting to really separate you from individuals it, it's not the point but it's really starting to show that hey you have put your time in in a diverse amount of areas and rock and that you've got strong enough and technically good enough where you can climb that grade um 513a was my goal last year and i came up short no. That's just the reality of the situation. I was doing a lot more big adventures, not training very much. Yeah. Because I was climbing outside all the time last year. I was like, oh, that is training. Yeah. You can't you can't tackle things like that because you're going to need to like be really like specific. Um, yeah. I mentioned earlier, like, you know, I don't have the best finger strength in the world. That was what was lacking. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, 513 was my goal last year. And I I have a new goal this year, and so far, I'm 20% of the way done. 20%. And this year, it's uh, like a volume thing, like you want to do a number of yeah, I would, particular difficulties? Yeah, I would I would like to climb five, 513 routes. Okay. And, um, what would, um, what advice would you give for picking a goal and going like full bore like to to go after it and achieve it i guess if you had any advice to yourself like a long time ago if you could talk to your younger self about achieving goals uh, any advice that you don't mm, <clears throat> don't give in to fomo fear of missing out yeah nope, don't give in don't give in to it because um something that's really prevalent in rock climbing is our, our uh influencers or just professionals sharing these incredible videos and photos of these unreal locations yeah doing, doing their own projects their own goals yeah and living their own life right, right? but a very different life um 
and being influenced by that and straying away from the process mm -hmm. was very detrimental. I mean, once you start to stray away from the process, I mean, you're just setting yourself back. And um, my big thing has always been FOMO in climbing. Like, um, I was much better about it in wrestling and jujitsu because it's like, oh, this is a very organized sport. Cl climbing's wild west of athletics. I mean, it's in the Olympics now, but as an individual pursuit in the outdoor uh, realm, it's very wild west. It's very up to you how you want to spend your time. And a lot of people just, hey, I'm just going out to climb like five weekends a year. Like, yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, those that make a lifestyle out of it, um, you just have to like stay on your own path. Stay on your own path. Yeah. Really like figure out like what motivates you to part uh, participate in this activity. And if you're honest with yourself, just don't stray away from like whatever motivates you. Yeah. This, uh, man, that hits home so well. This makes too much sense in my brain now when I'm thinking about things I've done in the past and then things I didn't complete is because I got distracted by something else, another shiny object, or the thought that I'm, because I don't live very long. If I don't do that too, then I'm like, I'm missing out. Yeah. yeah. But in reality, I'm missing out the potential of achieving or getting very, very good at something that I really care about and not caring so much about other people and what they think and stuff. And I used to think about this a lot with, with drinking, with uh, drinking alcohol. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, it's, I think I'm like a little over 90 days now without drinking it. I'm, I'm not going to quit for life, but this thought that if I didn't do it on the weekends with my friends, like I was going to be missing out and I was going to be only young for so long. Yeah. But in reality, now my other goals, I'm starting to like gain way more ground on and that's bringing me way more peace and happiness than um, going out and getting fucked up like for yeah. the for the weekend and not that i'm not trying hopefully it doesn't sound like i'm demonizing um alcohol especially here in colorado if you do like beer this place is the place to go where what brewery did uh we go to the other day new train new train yeah that um they had like hazy ipas and stuff or not alcoholic i had this root beer that was uh, really good not like root beer what you'd think like the soda but from an actual how, how do they even make that? They're actually asking around. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It was delicious. It was sweet, um, like rhubarb or something like that, or um, either way. It was good. It made my stomach feel good. So shout out to New Train. But so find picking something in particular and not worrying about other things distracting you. Have you had any distractions recently? Do you have any distract any like shiny objects that are pulling your pulling at your attention at all lately? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, getting a little older, um, it is it is tough because like you dive all into these like particular athletic pursuits or like lifestyles. And then, you know, you'll find these endearing people in your life. Yeah. And if you are truly passionate about it, you'll find other passionate folks. Yeah. Um, but sometimes it can be tough by like outside influences that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this selfish pursuit without any gain whatsoever, except for the like deliberate excitement and enjoyment you have with it. And I mean like sleeping in the dirt and, yeah. you know, being a little pickier in the grocery store is a like deliberate lifestyle choice. Like, as a climber, like we refer to it as like dirt bagging. Yeah. I'm like high class dirt bag. Like, hey, you know, I live very simply, but you know, I'm not like out of my van and stuff. I'd not be caught in one of those anytime soon. But um, you know, you get a little bit older and you're like, you know, still living like you're 23. Mm -hmm. And you know, outside influences will kind of like work their way into your thought process. And that, that'll be the biggest thing that'll kind of distract me. Yeah. It's like, Hey, you're being very deliberate about your lifestyle choices, which to 
most seem almost neglectful. Yeah. And I mean, a if you're responsible and you're like, if, if you're aware that this is a fleeting chapter yeah, and like, Hey, you know, you do put things in perspective, it's not dangerous, but if you ignore that aspect of life, that's when it becomes dangerous. But that's probably what like deviates me away from like being motivated more often than not. Yeah. This, uh, this concept of like eating clean and I mean, you've been, uh, you've been eating pretty clean, um, many moons. Yeah. Lately this, uh, or shoot, what, um, any recommendations on, on keeping a, a healthy diet? Um, oh, uh, no, we can talk breakfast. Breakfast. Um, yeah. yeah. You, were, you were eating your super breakfast the other day. What's in this, what's in this, uh, pile of, uh, goodness. <laughs> So every morning I'll eat like a third of a red pepper with hummus. I'll slice up some cucumber, eat it with hummus, eat half an avocado with hot sauce. And then I'll overnight or uh, do overnight oats mm -hmm. with blueberries, raspberries, honey, chunky peanut butter, and a banana. And that'll be my breakfast. Damn. Yeah. Vitamin and mineral galore. Yeah. Uh, it's, I think, I always got confused with supplements being a, when I was first wanting to get into health and fitness, I always forgot like that, how important quality food was. And I was like, Oh, I'll just supplement. I, I'm drinking protein, bro. And yeah. Yeah. The, Protein's key. Yeah. Drinking, you know, three scoops away with every meal. Um, very wasteful by the way, you pee out a lot of that, but don't get suckered and in yeah GNC. anyway the but forgetting how important or knowing that if you're gonna do anything with health and nutrition it seems like really high quality foods seems like the way to to really start and focus on um fruits and vegetables you can't go wrong with no and i mean something i think about all the time because i mean there are days where like i'll be with uh, my best partner uh tal and you know you're like okay hey we're gonna go do this like thousand foot route we brought a liter and a half water each and mm -hmm. yeah we should be done in like five hours ten hours later you're like just wrapping things up <laughs> and your body's starting to eat away at itself and your lips are super chapped mm -hmm. and you're sunburnt and it's like well hopefully you put some rocket fuel in there beforehand so you're not just suffering throughout yeah. the day because i mean like what you feel yourself with is what will carry you throughout most of the day so i mean i you know not you know i still have a beer every once in a while and sometimes like on climbing trips i get suckered into it like around the campfire i'll smoke a few beers yeah next day if you're out epicking you're sweating out all the poison and you're just like oh my god this is way harder than i want it to be right now. yeah mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean if you wake up crush a donut and you're like oh i'm gonna go climb thousand feet worth of 511 it's like dude you're in for a rude rude day right my yak <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> this uh getting older it seems like when you're young it's you're so much more like a sponge whether it's falling or eating not not that great of foods and still like being able to have a million megawatts of energy or however yeah yeah you would put that how are um you have a birthday coming up 30 30 dirty 30 yep you uh what's your relationship with getting older how you uh you're you're gonna be 30 um I just, i'll look like i'm still 24 so i'm pretty excited hey yeah. long term game long term game dude just wait <laughs> just wait until the but you're so physically active you know you gotta be thinking about that kind of stuff you have a healthy relationship with getting older or like what's some advice you would give about just kind of as you're moving and you're changing your body yeah i mean uh i wish i would have stretched a lot more in college. stretching yeah oh my gosh when i was in college and i mean like i got a lot better about it when i was out of college and in jujitsu and stuff um also flexibility was like always critical to flexibility me. yeah but it's like i was always a little bit flexible 
especially in college with my style of wrestling, but then in jujitsu, like you needed even more flexibility, but now it's just for recovery. Cause, um, you know, like today, you know, trained for a couple hours and, you know, it, you put that much mileage on yourself. It's like, you really need to decompress and let the muscles relax and right. inflammation and muscle tightness um, yeah. to the best of your capability. So stretching, absolutely key um and then just a good form of decompression like if you're passionate about something you're gonna burn out too yeah um i mean there are a few things in my life that haven't burnt out and like one of them is pizza i don't know but uh <laughs> pizza pizza stands the test of time it, it truly is timeless the greatest creation ever it's up there it's just like when it comes to something you're passionate about i i, I can barely consume climbing media i'm already burnt out it's only been a couple of years and i'm like you know what it's the same song and dance i don't want to hear it anymore you know during football season sunday i'll go epic and i'm like oh my god i just got away with something really dumb come back turn on sunday night football and just not think mm -hmm. or other practices you know you can wake up be really deliberate put your phone on airplane mm -hmm. mode maybe like play some like instrumental music with no lyrics mm -hmm. stretch and just be really deliberate about being in a silent stimulus free place mm -hmm. and like kind of shelter yourself from like your passion or like something that you have to work on like very very adamantly with this uh so stretching have you ever taken a yoga class I have. I have. Do you recommend it? I, I found it to be awesome and something else like, hey, you would like to be in a nice environment, um, a very friendly environment and exercise and meet new people. I would really recommend it. Um, personally, I've spent too many years in a small room with sweaty people. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, at the end of the day, like I, I thought it was awesome. And if someone has the slightest intrigue in yoga, I couldn't advocate for it more mm -hmm. personally i'm just like yeah you know i could stretch at home yeah this uh it seems getting on the age of getting older i've seen a decent amount of rock climbers who are pretty old oh yeah and is it do a lot of people make it long or do like think a lot of people burn out of it or do you think a lot of people like they you it's something you you can do for a really long time or... oh it's for sure something you can do for a long time and climbing's in this weird like revolutionary uh age where there's actual sports science in it now like yeah. a bunch of people went to college climbing freaks and then they got physiotherapist degrees mm -hmm. and they're like oh so this is how the body works and like mm -hmm. the old guard they were just doing it horribly wrong yeah and now like there's so much we've learned just in the last five years with the growth of the popularity of the sport um but yeah people people are still climbing and i mean um my rope access evaluator um also named steve uh, <laughs> i ran into him recently he's still climbing 512 damn 59 59 still climbing 512 good for him yeah um that's like the new 40 it is actually it's oh. uh getting wild how spry and i mean people aren't doing labor jobs for 50 years now yeah like and then beating the crap out of themselves so they they can actually do recreational things it seems like for a lot longer no totally and then you know it also a, a big dropout of climbing feeds into ego so those have been climbing for many many years and remember yesteryear a little too fondly mm, um yeah you know it's like oh well i used to climb this difficulty mm -hmm. but now you know i'm a little older i've had kids and you know i've got a house and a mortgage and you know i'm sitting at the office a lot more instead of like living out of my truck climbing <laughs> right. right like you're just not as fit as you once were right and then it's like well that's a nat natural progression mm -hmm. and you know if that satisfies you awesome but then you have to build this healthy relationship with your ego and then what you used to do with climbing becomes null and void like you're in a new chapter right mm -hmm. and uh i mean i'm excited because you know joked the dirty 30 but it's like oh cool like i'm just now hitting like my physical prime as a 
as a man. Totally. I'm really excited for the future. Yeah. No, that's that's really awesome. This uh I wanted to get a would you rather from uh would you rather from you? We always like to play. Would <laughs> it's you the rather. best way to pass the time on a road trip. This would you rather be able to climb or yeah. So would you rather be two grades stronger? So going up two steps in difficulty, like being better in two uh two degrees up, like from your climbing, so you could climb say what would be two grades up for you uh 513 c 513 c so you can you'll have that strength but you can't climb for a year mm. or you just stay where you're at which one would you take i would just stay where i'm at stay where you're at you gotta love the process you love the process perfect answer <laughs> yes that's why i was hoping you would say <laughs> this uh kind of just hopefully when you get caught up i mean it's probably so easy to get caught up and wanting so you want this goal for me it's like a particular size with uh this company and yada yada and then forgetting about talking to people and working with them and trying to help them in between it and then you but if i were to ask you do you i'm always focused on the end result and the end result drives me crazy but if i just we ask simple questions like what do you enjoy more people always just say the process and it's oh, like yeah. oh duh i um so recently when I did climb my first 513, my best friend, the guy I live with here on the property, uh, you know, was the one that was like feeding me rope and made sure that I wouldn't like, you know, fall too, too far. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my absolute best friend was with me feeding me rope as I was like climbing the hardest thing I've ever climbed. Mm -hmm. And he's also the person that I trained with a bunch. And he's the person that I did all these things you know, send me with and having your best friend there, like accomplishing your goal after putting in that much time. Like if you were just given that, the intensity of the moment would be lost. Cause I mean, I'd be a liar if I told you I didn't tear up a little bit. Totally. So There's like all those endless hours of doing the same things, falling, failing over and over again. And then you succeed. Yeah. And you're, best friends are there to have beers with you afterwards and uh it's an amazing feeling and then just like oh you just have to be patient and do nothing for a year it's like what kind of reward would that be it's like oh i'm stronger i missed out on all these like human experiences in the meantime it's like, right man, forget that the human experience well it's um it's really inspiring to have you as an older brother much much love to you goal pursuit i'm so excited to continue to kind of see how you handle things and continue to do things um i guess uh before we wrap up today i'm sure uh mom would kill me if i didn't ask you to give me a hug so ah, get, get, over yeah. get over yeah. here get over here love you mom love you too <laughs> this was episode uh interview with captain steve brother superhero super freak excited to see more adventures to come Thanks for checking us out, and I'll catch you on the next morning show. Until next time. Cheers, cheers. We out. Until next time, have a good one, everybody. Thanks for checking out our content. If you want to learn more about investing in yourselves and working with me and our company personally, we offer a six-week Total Life Mastery Boot Camp where we go over the most important topics to make sure that our life has the foundation we need to catapult us forward to take the right and proper actions to become happier and more productive guaranteed or our money back.